Back in 1983, I got my first computer, a Commodore 64. That's a story in itself, but today I want to show you the assembly language RPG I was working on and look at future plans and possibilities. Yeah, I'm a bit older and wiser than I was back then, so I understand what a huge undertaking completing my game is going to be. But it's one of those loose threads in my life that I deeply regret. So if I can pull it all together and make an awesome game out of this, it would be a huge item off my bucket list. So I'm hoping that you'll help me along the way to make sure that it's as cool as it can be and provide some moral support and accountability. I called my game by the working title Digital Dungeon Master, or DDM for short. It was inspired by a very early dungeon crawler called Telengard that was distributed by Avalon Hill, and I was a huge Avalon Hill board gamer at the time. I was amazed by Telengard's limited line of sight and thought I could do something like that, but with a surface world and multiple characters as well. I have not played Telengard since 1984 or maybe 85, but I thought it was worth a try loading this cassette from the Stone Collection. I was pleasantly surprised when it actually loaded just fine when I tested it. I was a bit disappointed in the end though because I was never able to get the tape to load again even after a thorough head cleaning on the player. Still, I was able to play the game and it was a real blast from the past. Telengard is a brutal game that loves to throw high level baddies at your first level characters. It used an interesting way of simulating an enemy chasing you even though they're off the map with these dots that represent how far away they are. The itemization is simple, yet effective with most items simply having pluses to increase their power. Overall it was a really fun game. I think it was the first RPG I ever got on the Commodore 64 and before that I think the only RPG I ever played was Wizardry which I played on the Apple IIs in high school. The overworld was really inspired by two things. First and foremost was my original Dungeons and Dragons world that I made sometime around 1980. I plan to try to use as much as I can from this world as the game is built out, but sadly much of the accompanying documentation has been lost. At least the main map is still around. The other inspiration I think is pretty obvious. The Ultima games were a huge part of my early computer days, and Ultima 4, Quest of the Avatar, is still my all-time favorite game for the Commodore 64. With enormous world maps and multiple characters in the party, these games set the standard for early RPGs. Add in Ultima 4's quest for self-improvement, and these games are hugely unique, even to this day. <laughs> so cool. Before I can contemplate even working on it, I need to have it in a state that it's usable for development. Much of the early code was written using a machine language monitor cartridge called Hesmon, so I only have the executable machine code for it. I had no idea how you did assembly. I was learning out of books and I could afford the cartridge, so that's how I did it. But wow, looking back, oh, what I would have given for an assembler if I'd known what it was. On top of that, much of the documentation I do have is from as early as May 29th, 1985. Holy crap, I just realized that's 38 years ago today. And as late as 1989. Let's take a quick look at what we have to work with. First of all, there's all the printed and handwritten listings and notes I kept from back in the day. The oldest of them are these two prints from my old Commodore 1520 plotter printer that used a roll of four and a quarter inch wide paper and four colored pens. This one in particular would turn out to be immensely valuable because of the detailed handwritten notes on how one quadrant of the line of sight code worked. Yes, I commented my code by dumping the assembly to paper and then handwriting notes. 
Next is this memory dump with 4K of RAM from C000 to CFFF, which I just noticed is actually dated from April 1985, a month before the plotter prints. I assumed this was from later since I did not own a dot matrix printer at this time. Some of these handwritten notes are from almost 40 years ago, while others are from last week. In June of 1985, about a month after these were printed, my best friend and I quit our jobs at a burger joint in Corvallis, Oregon, and headed to Seattle to look for work. We ended up living out of his van in a local park while we were looking for work in a bad economy. Within a month, the van threw a rod and I ended up with a severe case of pneumonia. So we was left with a hard choice, either move back in with my mom, who couldn't afford me, or join the army. Hooah! There's also some source code listings here from around 1986, I'd guess. This was while I was in the army and had purchased a Commodore 128. I was working on rewriting the code with an assembler this time, but that was never completed because I bought an Amiga 500 in 1987. This also included a couple basic listings of the code that I was using to test the machine language routines. That proved really useful for determining where variables were stored and what entry points to use to actually run the game. Okay, so I have bits and pieces of the project from various points in its creation, but they don't all work together, as you can see by the font corruption in all my tests up to this date. Still, I have one more kind of paper asset that will prove to be invaluable. All the hand-drawn maps, fonts, character set plans, disk sector use plans, menus, player commands, character stats and equipment, and much more was saved. Apparently, I saved just about everything that was handwritten, which will really help in recreating the overall design. Finally, as you may have seen in my first 1541 repair video, I found that some of my original discs still work. While preparing this video, I was able to figure out that one of the discs is from before I got the Commodore 128 and as such is in a working state, although without some improvements and added maps made later. Still, having code that is not mismatched or incomplete helps a lot. Not all the discs work, but there's enough here to work with. Okay, so that's what I have to work with here. But if you thought I was just going to dump all this on you and pray that I could get it to a usable state, then think again. So about a month ago, while I was dealing with more dental fun, I decided I'd go ahead and get an assembler set up and just see where that would get me. I decided to go with Visual Studio Code, the Commodore 64 debugger, Vice, and Kick Assembler, or Kick Ass if you prefer. It's time to kick ass and chew bubble gum, and I'm all out of gum. So after a couple of weeks of reading books and watching videos to get back up to speed on 6502 machine language on the Commodore 64, I typed in all the code and did a little tweaking and I'm happy to announce I have the game's map code working in exactly the same state it was in when I left off 35 years ago with a couple of differences. First, there's no basic code. It's 100% assembler unless you want to count the single line of basic loader code. All the code has been manually typed in and commented so it's true source code and not just the executable. And all the data has been converted into assembly data files that can be edited but are true imports of the original data. You can run around the surface world and explore what little map there is so far and if you stand on the cave in that one mountain, you can press X to descend into the dungeon. In the dungeon, you can only see spaces where your line of sight is not blocked and you can move around freely since there's no check for walkability yet. If you return to the space you started in, then X will return you to the surface. All told, it's currently using about 12K of RAM, roughly split evenly between code and data. I already noticed a ton of things I can do to improve this, but it was important for me to start where I left off. So my plan is to do fairly long quarterly sprints with an update video as each one is completed. There will be a theme to each sprint and I will outline the changes that I need to make to get that working. And then there will be other changes that you can vote on. There will be two items selected by the community, one by patrons and one by the community at large. There's gonna be a link to the current poll in the description below. Best of all, everybody can vote twice because I'm gonna post the public poll on my YouTube community channel 
and on Patreon, but as a public poll, so no, no membership required. I guess that means the patrons can vote three times. So the first change I plan to make is number one, number two, and number three is I gotta get source control set up so that if I code myself into a corner, I can back out and I have a backup of everything. Now the theme for this quarter is going to be to complete the map code. I'll start by getting the colors fixed so that the dungeon walls don't have the colors from the last outside map displayed. This will be a really easy fix, so while I'm at it, I'll also fix the screen outline so they'll work cleanly in the dungeon as well as the overworld. And finally, I need to make a change to the way the map data is stored. Currently, I'm storing one byte for every other space in a checkerboard pattern. That means each wall space is represented by only two bits. It's memory efficient, but very limiting. There can only be four states, a wall, a door, a secret door, which is represented by both having a wall and a door, or nothing there at all. So what I plan to do is change this to one byte per space, which will reduce the dungeon to 64 by 64 spaces, which I still think is ample. That makes the dungeon take 4K of RAM, plus the storage for features, items, and monsters. It could even be optimized to a 48 by 48 square map, which would free up almost 2K. To achieve this, I could store three bits per wall for two walls in each space. If the data on one of the other two walls is needed, it would be retrieved from the adjacent space, which is how the current code works now. That will allow a wall space to be empty or have any one of seven things instead of only three. That gives options such as different wall colors, locked doors, and more. So that leaves two more bits. I'll use one to track which spaces the player has already seen, which would be useful for a possible map view. The final bit is undecided, but I'm leaning towards using it to track if there is anything, such as a monster, a trap, or an item in the space. That would allow the code to only have to look through the list of stuff when it's really needed, but at the expense of having to track and store that bit. Some of you may also be wondering how you'll be able to play when the game is ready. I plan for it to run fine using the Vice emulator or actual hardware. I also plan to look into using real or emulated REUs to enhance performance. I'm not certain how I'll distribute it, but I expect to offer at least a downloadable version. I'd love to offer a full version with a box manual and actual media, but that'll have to wait for later exploration. Okay, so now you know what the current plan is, but I want to hear from you. Do you see any pitfalls or errors? Post them in the comments. Please keep in mind this project is representative of the state of early RPGs on the Commodore 64, so it won't be as elaborate as something like The Bard's Tale. See the description below for links to the polls and vote for your favorite feature. Thanks for coming!